Hello all and welcome to Stingray Toms, Florida and another deeper dive into the archive. Today I'm sharing an unusual story, one of Florida's most visited attractions during its more than 50 years of operation, but I'll bet few of you have ever heard of it. Known as Webb's City, it was a unique fixture in St. Petersburg. While Webb's didn't refer to itself as a department store, basically that's what it was. Department stores developed in Britain and in the U.S. in the 19th century with major ones such as Marshall Field & Company in Chicago and Macy's in New York opening in the 1850s. By the early 20th century, huge department stores were common in the largest cities in America, but there weren't any in Florida. The population was simply too small. Jacksonville, our most populous city in 1920, had 91,000 inhabitants, while Miami only had 30,000. While there were smaller stores that sold a variety of items, the massive department store didn't exist in the Sunshine State. That makes our story today all the more unusual. When James Earl Webb opened a drugstore in downtown St. Petersburg in 1925, the population was roughly 18,000, a small city. While Webb's shop was just a simple drugstore, one selling questionable patent remedies as well as some of the first modern medications, it didn't stay small for long. As time passed, it morphed into a department store and even became a tourist attraction, one of the first in the St. Pete area. The story of James Earl Webb and what would become Webb City is one of the most interesting parts of Florida tourism history. So let's look at James Earl Webb. As I create videos, I'll occasionally take a look at the important and influential entrepreneurs who developed many of Florida's early attractions. They're all interesting individuals who, for the most part, created their particular attractions without any significant professional expertise. These are individuals such as Newton Perry, who created Wikiwachi, Dick Pope, the developer of Cypress Gardens, Franz Scher of Parrot Jungle, George Turner of Sunken Gardens, and Owen Godwin of Gatorland. We can arguably add James Webb to this list. There's two basic things that define these entrepreneurs. The first is that they took unusual risks in order to develop what they hoped would become successful businesses. And secondly, they were driven to promote their business any way they could, so many of them would even promote themselves as part and parcel of their attraction. James Earl Webb was born in 1899 in Nashville, Tennessee. Like most in that area, his was a Scots and Irish ancestry. His parents both grew up in Glasgow, Kentucky, only about 80 miles or 130 kilometers to the north. Webb's early life isn't well documented. Indeed, part of what we know is from the publicity department of his store, so how factual it is is unknown. He was famous for not revealing too much about his personal life, even to close friends. Fairly small in stature, standing only 5 foot 5 inches or under 1.7 meters and weighing about 130 pounds or 60 kilos, St. Petersburg's most famous entrepreneur had a father who was a paving contractor and a mother who loved to dance and ride horses. The parents moved to Nashville soon after getting married. They had six kids, Bunny, Loyal, James Earl, Alan, and Louise. James appears to have been an entrepreneur from the start. His sister Louise would say that while the rest of the siblings played, Webb would work having two paper routes, a vegetable garden, and a business selling items bought in bulk for a profit, essentially running a retail business. Webb began working at least by the age of nine, if not earlier. Part of the reason for this was that around that time his father was injured and temporarily couldn't work, so Webb said he and his mom, quote, sort of took over the family. Of course, lots of kids had paper routes, 
Walt and Roy Disney, along with their father Elias, managed one, but Webb not only had a morning and afternoon route, he also managed the routes of 12 other paper boys. He sold the milk from the family's cow, peddled his vegetables and fresh-baked bread, bowed lawns, and in a nod to his future home, he had a lemonade and orangeade stand, using unsold juice to make sherbet. Webb said that he hated school. Oh, how I hated it. I would sit there in class, not seeing the book in front of me. I didn't hear what the teacher said. I had a hell of a lot of things on my mind, things I wanted to do. I got lousy grades, played a lot of hooky, and finally quit. It's thought he stopped going altogether in the seventh grade, but it could have been as early as the fifth. I suppose we know now why he could have so many jobs. When he was 12, his dad's work took the family eastward to Knoxville, which would be the first time Webb's business empire had to unceremoniously shut down. Since he was becoming a teen, he was able to get more regular jobs, including two that are obsolete today. Pin setter in a bowling alley, this was before a machine could do that, and soda jerk in the Todd Armistead's drugstore. The drugstore would have a significant impact on Webb. Always looking to make a profit, he would realize that medicine sales were highly profitable. Modern medicine, which is based on scientific biomedical research, was still in its infancy in the early 20th century. For instance, Bayer had developed aspirin by 1899, and the first antibiotic was discovered in 1908. When Webb was working as a soda jerk, the vast majority of medicines offered in drugstores were, at best, based on folk remedies. Various salves, ointments, tinctures, unguents, spirits, elixirs, panaceas, and other nostrums were presented as patent medicines and were prescribed by doctors, midwives, dentists, and veterinarians. While some of these medicines were indeed helpful remedies, plenty others could be more appropriately be called snake oil. The term snake oil has been established in American culture as a reference to any worthless concoction sold as medicine. It comes from Clark Stanley's snake oil liniment, which was to be used externally for rheumatism, neuralgia, sciatica, lumbago, toothache, sprains, swellings, frostbite, sore throat, and animal bites. Not surprisingly, it was a popular nostrum. However, in 1916, the U.S. government examined Stanley's concoction and found it to be of no value. The government found that it didn't contain any snake oil and was actually comprised of mineral oil, tallow, capsaicin from chili peppers, turpentine, and camphor. While the liniment's lack of medicinal value was significant, the amount of profit Clark Stanley made from it was cited by the government as being drastically overpriced. Stanley was fined all of $20. James Webb realized that a quick profit could be made in medicines and their huge price markups. At the time, druggists and medicine makers didn't need a license, so Webb figured it'd be pretty easy to get into the business. Learning that a local doctor was doing well selling good luck bags containing health-giving herbs, Webb designed his own good luck charm with a mixture of herbs and sold them for around $3. That would be about $50 each in 2022. By this time, at the age of 20, he was manager and part owner of the Economy Drug Store and was creating a collection of questionable medicines. One of his concoctions was labeled as Wahoo Indian Bitters. It was promoted as a laxative and purportedly contained Epsom salts, herbs, water, and alcohol. Certainly Epsom salts is useful as a laxative, though at a dollar a bottle the medicine was highly expensive. Yet another medicine that he developed was known as Doc Webb's 608, and yes, Webb was so successful as a druggist and medicine maker he acquired the nickname Doc. Doc Webb's 608 was an elixir made from a gum arabic and sandalwood. Webb said it cost him about 70 cents for each bottle, and the drugstore sold it for $5.50. The elixir was supposed to treat unnatural diseases, particularly gonorrhea, which is caused by a bacterium, something unlikely to be affected by Doc's ingredients. Nevertheless, the questionable medicine sold well, 
quickly becoming popular throughout Tennessee and neighboring states. Webb credited his 608 as the drug that created a nest egg, which allowed him and his wife to move to St. Petersburg and start a new drugstore. As I mentioned before, St. Pete was a fairly small city in the mid-1920s. Located on the western side of Tampa Bay, it developed along with its neighboring city of Tampa on the east side. In the 20s, St. Pete was becoming popular with a new type of tourist. While cities on the east coast, such as St. Augustine and Palm Beach, grew because wealthy northerners would spend their winters living in luxurious hotels, St. Pete would see travelers with less impressive incomes. Often called snowbirds, these were retirees who could afford to winter in the state in more modest hotels. This would give St. Pete two population figures, the general year-round population and the winter season. At the age of 26, Doc Webb and his wife Marie would take their tidy nest egg and move to St. Pete. That was 1925, in the midst of the Roaring Twenties and the Florida land boom. That same year, Webb would buy a local drugstore with a partner. The drugstore is pictured in this photo, often presented in Webb's brochures. It was located at the corner of 9th Street and 2nd Avenue, today named Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Avenue. That placed it on the western side of downtown, and today the corner is just a couple blocks away from Tropicana Field, the home of the Tampa Bay Rays baseball team and an awesome Stingray touch tank. I haven't been able to find out what Webb's drugstore was originally called, or even the name of Webb's partner, but the promotional material for Webb City says that he bought out the partner in the first year. Webb himself is quoted as saying his former partner was much too conservative. The 476 square foot or 44 square meter store, which Webb said was located in one of the poorest parts of town, was considered a modest success in the first year. It appears that he was lucky to invest when he did, considering that four years later the Great Depression would hit and many businesses that weren't financially stable would close. First year receipts reportedly reached nearly $40,000, while the next year they would more than double to $90,000. When the Depression hit, Web City's publicity only mentioned that sales steadily increased. Once again, it's hard to trust the numbers the company put in brochures and on postcards, but the business was obviously growing. Sales totals passed a $1,000,000 in 1946 and reached $2 million just one year later. One of the reasons the drugstore became a success is that Webb was able to sell much of his merchandise at lower prices than his competitors. Reportedly, here's that word again, his competitors asked for a meeting with Webb where they suggested he raise his prices so they could all make more money. This was a little business tactic known as collusion, a secret cooperation between two or more parties to limit open competition. Doc walked out of the meeting after telling them that he gets together with no one. A man of his words, he would create an ad campaign that used the slogan, All competitors advertise prices 10% less at Webb's and he would post the ad sheets of the other stores in his store so shoppers knew how much they could save. Webb City continued to grow as Doc added new ventures to what was rapidly beginning to become a department store, albeit one that utilized a number of separate nearby buildings. Now, much of the information I have is from the 50s and 60s when Webb City was mostly fully evolved, so we'll skip the war years and talk about what the store contained and how it became St. Petersburg's most popular tourist attraction. As you can see in this directory from 1953, there were some 55 departments spread out among six buildings all in a few adjacent blocks. By the 60s, that would become over 70 departments. While I've described Web City as a department store, it also had elements that made it an early version of a discount big box store. In fact, the 1953 date of this brochure is interesting, since the acknowledged precursor to stores like Kmart and Walmart was founded in 1953. The store, Ann and Hope, got its start in Cumberland, Rhode Island, and in the early 1960s grew into an enterprise which both Sam Walton, the founder of Walmart, and Harry Cunningham, the founder of Kmart, credited with giving them the idea to develop their own discount stores. 
Web City developed into a mixture of traditional department store and modern-day box store. While it had counter staff that could assist customers, parts of Web City were self-service. Even though it was in downtown and actually located next to streetcar lines, Doc Webb insisted on putting in parking lots, something that Ann and Hope would do a few years later. It also included a grocery store as well as a full cafeteria, neither of which were common in department stores. Really, the biggest difference might have been the fact that Webb chose to add buildings instead of building larger and larger stores. Also, like department stores, the main Webb store had four floors as well as a basement. Yes, a basement in Florida. And the furniture building had seven floors. In the 50s, Web City, now well known as the world's most unusual drugstore, reportedly saw 60,000 visitors on an average day. That was nearly two-thirds of the population of St. Pete itself. Every day. Sales reached over $30 million a year. Beginning with less than 500 square feet, by 1951, only 26 years later, the local newspaper reported that Webb City took up 85,000 square feet, or some 7,900 square meters of indoor retail space, and the parking lots had over 2,000 spaces. The low prices and monumental variety drew the locals. Shoppers could fill their prescriptions at Doc's original drugstore, and then they could also enjoy a mile-high cone at the ice cream shop, get their tires changed at the auto service station, pick up a bouquet at the florist, and get live fish bait, camping equipment, or a power drill at the hardware store, better known as the trading post. One of the most unusual features was the Arthur Murray Dance Studio, which was located next to the roof garden at the top of the store. The garden even had a stage for performances. The buildings had elevators and escalators, the latter some of the first installed in Florida. There was a full-service butcher shop in the grocery, as well as fresh ground coffee, featuring Doc's special blend. There was a men's barber shop with haircuts for 25 cents, a beauty salon, and a wig fitting center. One of the most remarkable things that Doc instituted were the flash sales. If you are old enough, you might remember Kmart's blue light specials, random sales that would happen several times a day under a flashing blue light. Webb's flash sales were a couple orders of magnitude beyond that. The favorite quote from Doc was, stack it high and sell it cheap. One time the flash sale product titled New Zealand Steak went for 37 cents a pound. Within an hour, several thousand pounds were sold. Then there was the famous gold rush of August 1943. Ten tons of yellow onions were put on sale on the sidewalk. The line of buyers extended around the corner and through an alley. While the sales were generally good bargains, sometimes they were a gimmick to build word-of-mouth advertising. The most memorable of these was the time that Doc offered dollar bills for sale at 95 cents. He then offered to buy them back the next day for $1.35. The next time he did the stunt, he dropped the sale price to $0.89. He also liked people to come early and the massive cafeteria was open even before the store was. Eventually it could seat 500 customers and at one time offered a breakfast plate for $0.02. Then there were the topsy-turvy days. Customers came to expect Doc to jump suddenly on a counter and announce that bed sheets were on sale for the low, low price of two sixty nine, but the catch was that the sheets were at the soda fountain. You could get a great deal on dish soap, but you'd find it outside of menswear. The trading post, as I mentioned, would be your stop for hardware and sporting goods, as well as paints and auto accessories. It was also the location for the full-service auto shop and gas station. Like Sam's Club, you could get a discount on gas, but there was no need to buy a membership. Webb's Plant City was a complete garden center and pet store. Here's where you could get fertilizer and fencing, seeds and shrubbery, as well as birds, lizards, and monkeys. And then there was the entertainment. Owning a store that provided nearly everything a person could use wasn't enough for Doc. The small-statured entrepreneur felt that promotion was the key to success. At one point, an ad called Web City a summer playground, and it really was. 
the dancing chicken generated excitement at 10 cents a dance. There was a piano playing duck who used to break into Sweet Georgia Brown on his tiny piano. Other ducks played baseball and bunnies kissed. Then there were the mermaids. While not living, breathing mermaids like the beauties at Wikiwachi further up the coast, they did interact with the visitors. Located in the underwater grotto, the mannequins that were dressed like mermaids were voiced by hidden employees who chatted through a microphone. There were occasional promotions like this. Imagine stopping by the store one day and you find that one of the parking lots is filled up with top acts from the Ringling Brothers and Barnum and & Bailey Circus, straight from their winter quarters in Sarasota. Trained horses, trapeze artists, chimpanzees, trampoline artists, clowns, and even the world-famous Zucchini family and their cannonball act, all provided at great expense by Doc Webb for his customers to enjoy. But that's not all. Not content with the mermaids, Doc wanted his own living beauties, just like the ones appearing at Cypress Gardens and Silver Springs, and so he invented his poster girls. This 1966 booklet states, Webb's internationally known poster girls have appeared from coast to coast from Maine to Florida. They have been featured on major network television and radio shows, including The Ed Sullivan Show. The girls have also staged fashion and talent shows in the country's major theaters and the nation's most prominent department stores. Webb's poster girls were chosen annually from thousands of applicants. They have brought untold millions of publicity to the Florida Suncoast, St. Petersburg, and Webb City. The fact that three of Webb's beauties were entrants in the Miss American contest at Atlantic City and that two of them were close seconds attested Doc's skill at judging feminine pulchitude. The booklet from 1966 was referring to a long history of Webb's poster girls serving as the front line of the store's publicity campaigns. Twenty years earlier, barely a year after the official end of World War II, a group of eight bathing beauties from St. Petersburg appeared in Life magazine. In a chartered plane, Doc Webb sent his poster girls to represent Florida in what was likely a hastily improvised competition with California beauties. Dressed in white crop tops, shorts, and high heels, the Florida women were literally packaged as a commodity, each bearing a large tag addressed to the Los Angeles Chamber of Commerce and wrapped in cellophane. While it wasn't unusual for the state of Florida to send gifts of citrus to officials around the U.S., this might have been the only time women were presented the same way, albeit with tongue firmly placed in cheek. Life magazine detailed the visit on two pages and described it as a daring attempt to prove once and for all that Florida's sun-kissed residents are prettier than California's. Life stated that California didn't have a similar organization as the Poster Girls, so the L.A. Chamber of Commerce simply recruited their eight bathing beauties to defend the state and be hosts to the visitors. Three judges proclaimed that all of the women were too beautiful for them to decide between either state, and so the publicity stunt ended in a tie. The poster girls stayed in California for four days. As Life says, all of this was a big publicity stunt for the poster girls, a busty contingent of teenagers hired by Doc Webb to model the latest fashions at his drugstore. Note that the unnamed Life writer didn't bother to explain why a drugstore was selling the latest fashions. Life continues by stating, The eight girls were selected from some 300 he trains as models in order, he says, to lessen juvenile delinquency. Oddly enough, of the eight poster girls who traveled to L.A. in 1946, only one was born in Florida and two were born in California. Such was the fame of Webb City. Promotions such as these guaranteed that the world's most unusual drugstore was known throughout the country at the same time Florida tourism was entering its golden age. The 50s and 60s saw dozens of major attractions and even more minor attractions throughout the state. Prior to the development of the interstate highway system, the attractions were located on main roads such as U.S. routes 1, 17, 19, 90, and 441. Other attractions were placed in the rapidly growing cities, including Miami, Fort Lauderdale, Tampa, Sarasota, and, of course, St. Petersburg. 
It's particularly interesting that Doc Webb chose to promote his store to tourists, as his was really the only store that we can definitively place on a list of Florida attractions. Evidence of Webb's focus on tourism comes from the postcards of the store, which started in the 1930s, as well as promotional brochures, something that very few stores bothered to create. Then there was the souvenir booklet from 1966. Its quality is equal to those of other attractions and was being sold at the 2022 equivalent of $2.25. This booklet was designed to be a treasured souvenir from a family's Florida vacation. Today, we see billboards throughout much of northern Florida that tell visitors to head to Ron John Surf Shop in Cocoa Beach. Sixty years ago, those billboards would have been for webs. As popular as it was, today, Webb City is barely remembered in the state. Its downfall started in the late 1960s and culminated with the store closing in August 1979, 54 years after Doc opened his drugstore. The end began around the time of the construction of Walt Disney World, though in the grand scheme of things, the new resort had less of an impact on the store than it did on many other attractions. Tourists continued to visit St. Pete, but they no longer visited the old store as in the past. With the rise of shopping centers, box stores, and large malls throughout the country, visitors wouldn't consider the venerable store interesting. Webbs stated that it had stopped being profitable in 1973. The next year, Doc sold his stock to the Texas Bayed Mermaid Incorporated. Over the next five years, the new owners tried to save the store. They secured a $1 million loan in 1977, but it wasn't enough. Bankruptcy filing soon followed, and by 1980, each of the different buildings closed their doors for the final time. Doc Webb retired after he sold the store. While he was a lifelong showman, he had always kept his personal life private. So private that many of the people who knew him best admitted they didn't really know him. One such friend was Dr. Cornelius Frankel, an actual physician and longtime resident of St. Pete. He was quoted in 1980, Lots of people know Doc Webb, but they don't know him. Little was made of it, but he was considered one of the wealthiest St. Pete residents and was quietly known as a philanthropist. While he would hire black employees as early as the 1950s, like much of the South, they were relegated to basic jobs, often behind the scenes, and weren't given any opportunities to advance. In the early 1960s, the NAACP protested the store's policies through picketing and legal action, and Doc was pushed to change his treatment of the black staff. The case even went to the U.S. Supreme Court, but no decision was made there because Webb City's new policies were determined to have resolved the issue. Doc died in 1982 at the age of 83. While he witnessed the end of his empire, he didn't see the demolition of the main store as it was torn down in 1984. Ironically, the building which had seen so much fanfare over the decades was torn down without much public notice. In truth, Webb City really was the world's most unusual drugstore. It was also the most famous store in the Sunshine State. It's estimated that millions of people visited the store at one point or another in its 54 years. It was arguably the most unusual tourist attraction in the state, and it helped develop the concept of the big box discount stores that arose in the 1960s. At the start, I suggested that St. Pete was too small of a city to sustain a large department store, and it was. But Webb City didn't just rely on local residents. It drew customers from neighboring counties, as well as tens of thousands of tourists. James Earl Webb progressed from an ambitious and hardworking kid to a snake oil maker and seller, and then a retail empire builder. He helped shape the development of St. Petersburg and without planning to do so, created one of the most successful attractions during Florida tourism's golden age. Webb and his store are a unique American story, one that should be better known. Do you have any memories of shopping at Webb's? If you do, I'd love to hear from you. Please leave a comment below. 
Thank you for watching another of my videos. If you enjoyed it, please hit the like button and subscribe to learn more about Florida's tourism history. Stingray Tom's Florida, traveling through time around Sunshine State.